This audio presentation of My Method by Emil Kui has been brought to you by AudioEnlightenment.com. Copyright 2011. All rights reserved. Forward. Due to the tremendous success I've experienced with it, I felt a strong need to bring attention to Emil Kui's method of auto-suggestion. It is, in my opinion, incredibly brilliant in its simplicity. Having heard the phrase, every day in every way, I am getting better and better, many people have sought to improve on it. However, if you have read his book, they would truly understand Quee's method and realize why it is important not to attempt to improve it by adding specifics. Even Jose Silva, of the world-famous Silva method, in his attempt to personalize the phrase, only added an extra better to it. The subconscious mind, or our higher self if you prefer, knows what we need. There is no need, in fact, it is inadvisable to add specifics to our auto-suggestion. The awesome power of the subconscious mind enables it to know far better than we consciously do exactly what our needs are. Why then should we get in its way? There may very well be needs that must first be met before we can even begin to work on a need that we are aware of. During a particularly troubling period in my life, I kept a journal, faithfully entering my thoughts into it every night. I entered the bad occurrences as well as the good things. I got into the habit of every now and then reading back into the pages of my prior week's entries. Soon it became very evident to me that many of the bad events I wrote about had triggered good things. In fact, many of the good things I wrote about could never have happened if the bad things hadn't occurred first. In no time at all I became convinced that I didn't really know what was good for me or what was bad for me. What then should I meditate about or pray for? If I don't really know what's good for me, what then should my goals be? Someone much smarter than me advised, just ask for knowledge of what is best for you, and as that knowledge becomes apparent or available, try to act accordingly. Then they said, just keep doing the next right thing. In that light, Kui's statement makes all the sense in the world. Even though we may not know exactly what we need most, our subconscious or higher self knows, and we can use that knowledge by keeping the statement simple and trusting our subconscious for the results. Some hypnotists say that our subconscious mind doesn't know the difference between a real or an imagined experience. I don't even begin to buy that theory. I think our subconscious mind can operate in dimensions that we haven't yet been able to wrap our minds around. We don't know exactly how it works, but we have begun to know a little about how to use it. Some have even said that it doesn't respond to negative suggestions, then turn around and do regression to cause therapy to remove the effects of past negative impressions. Well then, what is your subconscious mind? Smart or dumb? I believe it's powerful and awesome, and a long time ago, Kui found a good way to use it. Read on, use it, and watch the results prove it. Chapter 1. The Reality of Autosuggestion I wish to say how glad I was to come into personal contact with the great American public on their own side of the Atlantic, and at the same time, I could not help feeling just a little embarrassed. I had an idea that people of that continent expected from me some wonderful revelation, bordering on the miraculous, whereas in reality the message I have to give is so simple that many are tempted at first to consider it almost insignificant. Let me say right here, however, that simple as my message may be, it will teach those who consent to hear it and to give fair thought a key to permanent physical and moral well-being which can never be lost. Auto-suggestion disconcerting in its simplicity To the uninitiated, auto-suggestion or self-mastery is likely to appear disconcerting in its simplicity. But does not every discovery, every invention seem simple and ordinary once it has become vulgarized and the details or mechanism of it known to the man in the street? Not that I am claiming auto-suggestion is my discovery, far from it. Auto-suggestion is as old as the hills, only we had forgotten to practice it, and so we needed to learn it all over again. Think of all the forces of the universe ready to serve us, yet centuries elapsed before man penetrated their secret and discovered the means of utilizing them. It is the same in the domain of thought and mind. We have at our service forces of transcendent value of which we are neither completely ignorant or else only vaguely conscious. Power of auto-suggestion known in the Middle Ages. The power of thought of idea is incommensurable, is immeasurable. The world is dominated by thought. The human being individually is also entirely governed by his own thoughts, good or bad. The powerful action of the mind over the body, which explains the effects of suggestion, was well known to the great thinkers of the Middle Ages, whose vigorous intelligence embraced the sum of human knowledge. 
Every idea conceived by the mind, says St. Thomas, is an order which the organism obeys. It can also, he adds, engender a disease or cure it. The efficacy of autosuggestion could not be more plainly stated. Pythagoras and Aristotle taught autosuggestion. We know indeed that the whole human organism is governed by the nervous system, the center of which is the brain, the seat of thought. In other words, the brain or mind controls every cell, every organ, every function of the body. That being so, is it not clear that by means of thought we are the absolute masters of our physical organism, and that, as the ancients showed centuries ago, thought or suggestion can and does produce disease or cure it? Pythagoras taught the principles of autosuggestion to his disciples. He wrote, God the Father, deliver them from their suffering, and show them what supernatural power is at their call. Even more definite is the doctrine of Aristotle, which taught that a vivid imagination compels the body to obey it, for it is a natural principle of movement. Imagination, indeed, governs all the forces of sensibility, while the latter in its turn controls the beating of the heart, and through it sets in motion all vital functions. Thus the entire organism may be rapidly modified. Nevertheless, however, vivid imagination, it cannot change the form of a hand or a foot or any other member. I have particular satisfaction in recalling this element of Aristotle's teaching, because it contains two of the most important, nay, essential principles of my own method of autosuggestion. 1. The dominating role of the imagination. 2. The results to be expected from the practice of autosuggestion must necessarily be limited to those coming within the bounds of physical possibility. I shall deal with these essential points in greater detail in another chapter. Unfortunately, all of these great truths, handed down from antiquity, have been transmitted in a cloudy garb of abstract notions or shrouded in the mystery of esoteric secrecy, and thus have appeared inaccessible to the ordinary mortal. If I have had the privilege of discerning the hidden meaning of the old philosophers or extracting the essence of a vital principle and of formulating it in a manner extremely simple and comprehensible to modern humanity, I have also had the joy of seeing it practiced with success by thousands of sufferers for more than a score of years. Slaves of suggestion and masters of ourselves, mark well, I am no healer. I can only teach others to cure themselves and to maintain perfect health. I hope to show, moreover, that the domain of application of autosuggestion is practically unlimited. Not only are we able to control and modify our physical functions, but we can develop in any desired direction our moral and mental faculties merely by the proper exercise of suggestion. In the field of education, there is a vast scope for suggestion. From our birth to our death, we are all the slaves of suggestion. Our destinies are decided by suggestion. It is an all-powerful tyrant of which, unless we take heed, we are the blind instruments. Now it is in our power to turn the tables and to discipline suggestion, and direct it in the way we ourselves wish, then it becomes auto-suggestion. We have taken the reins into our own hands and have become master of the most marvelous instrument conceivable. Nothing is impossible to us except, of course, that which is contrary to the laws of nature and the universe. How are we to attain this command? We first must thoroughly grasp at least the elements of the mechanism of the mental portion of what constitutes the human being. The mental personality is composed of the conscious and the subconscious. It is generally believed that the power and acts of a man depend almost exclusively upon his conscious self. It is beginning to be understood, however, that compared with the immensity of the role of the subconscious, that of the conscious self is as a little islet in a vast ocean, subject to storm and tempest. Dominance of the subconscious over the conscious. The subconscious is a permanent, ultra-sensitive photographic plate with nudging escapes. It registers all things, all thoughts, from the most insignificant to the most sublime. But it is more than that. It is the source of creation and inspiration. It is the mysterious power that germinates ideas and affects their materialization in the conscious form of action. If we agree that the point of departure of our joys, our sorrows, our ills, our well-being, our aspirations, of all our emotions, is in our subconscious self, then we may logically deduct that every idea germinated in our mind has a tendency to realization. Hundreds of examples drawn from little incidents of everyday existence enable us to verify the truth of all this. 
To illustrate action of thought on the emotive faculties, we have but to remember any grave incident or harrowing spectacle, of which we have been a witness immediately to feel the sensation of pain or horror, with a greater sense or less intensity, according to our individual temperament. Imagine you are sucking a lemon. A simpler and perhaps even more striking example is the classic one of the lemon. Imagine that you are sucking a juicy, sour lemon, and your mouth will inevitably and instantaneously begin to water. What has happened? Simply this. Under the influence of the idea, the glands have gone to work and secreted an abundant quantity of saliva, almost as much, in fact, as if you had actually taken a bite of a real lemon. Again, just think of the scratching pencil being drawn perpendicular over a slate, and you cannot avoid shuddering and screwing up your face under the shock while contracted nerves send a shiver from the back of the head all the way down your spine. Impossible to separate the physical from the mental, we must therefore realize that it is impossible to separate the physical from the mental, the body from the mind, that they are dependent upon each other, that they are really one. The mental element, however, is always dominant. Our physical organism is governed by it, so that we actually make or mar our own health and destinies according to the ideas at work in our subconscious. I mean by this that we are absolutely free to implant whatever ideas we desire in our subconscious self, which is a never-flagging recorder, and those ideas determine the whole trend of our material, mental, and moral being. It is just as easy to whisper into our receptive subconscious self the idea of health as it is to moan over our troubles, and those who do may be certain of the results, because as I hope, I have convinced them it is based on nature's law. End of chapter.